Hey y'all, what's up? This is Chris from Blackstone Cherry, and you're watching The Helix Hour with Eric Broadbent. Hey, this is Vernon Reed from Living Color, and you're watching The Helix Hour. Hey guys, my name is Gemma Jura. I'm the guitar player for Evanescence, and you're watching The Helix Hour. Welcome to The Helix Hour, brought to you in part by Stuart Travel Guitars. See the incredible stowaway travel guitar at stuartguitars.com. Microphones for the Helix Hour are provided by Rode Microphones. Now, let's talk some Helix. Hey everyone, happy Sunday to you all and welcome to the Season 4 premiere of the Helix Hour. It's hard to believe we're already in Season 4. We're wrapping, we wrapped up Season 3 with a bass player, a phenomenal bassist, Mr. Billy Sheehan. And we're going to be kicking off season three we've wrapped up season four we're kicking off right now with another bass player from a band a few of you may have recognized they've got a couple hits on the radio i you know they're they're, they're on the radio they got some hits you've heard them the who we have mr john button from the who let's bring him on right now and john how are you i'm fantastic hi everybody so, happy to be here so nice to have you and i really appreciate it. i mean you guys have been extremely busy i mean you're you're as busy as they get but I appreciate you taking some time out with us, and uh, I could not think of a you know a more exciting way to kick off another season. It's it's funny you and I were talking about this off the air. Uh, you know, I wrapped up with a bass player. We're starting another bass player, and we're seeing more and more of that. And we're going to talk like as far as bass players with Helix, but we'll get into that and all the good stuff down the road. Uh, but just very very thankful to have some time with you today, and appreciate you uh, joining us. Happy to be here. Awesome. Well, listen, as I told you as well, too, we have a lot of cool people that really follow this channel, and a lot of them are, you know, I, I'd probably say the, the bigger bulk are guitar players, but we're seeing more and more bassists, you know, uh, embracing the technology of Helix, you know, from guys that are using, like, carrying the big amp pegs like you, you tour with and things like that as well, too, and just making things, flight travel is much easier now. I mean, I shouldn't say flight travel, but I mean, shipping things and co the cost of all that, you know, a cartage is very, very expensive. But let's go over and say hi to a bunch of people here in the chat. These are the f people that make the show what it is. We've got a uh -huh. bunch of people jumping in already. Stephen Nysmith is here. Six String Brian, a bass player slash guitar player, is here using Helix as well, too. Scott nice. Bruce, hello from Nova Scotia. Matt Krill, uh, let me see here, Scott. Uh, Butterfly and Ladybug Show, that's my better half here. She'll be sharing a lot of your links throughout the program uh, to right. your, all your various social media profiles. Uh, let me see. Uh, Django Amadeus O'Connell's here. And from uh, Kentucky, Bam Mazi is here. Carlos Santin, fellow Canadian friend and uh, Helix user. Happy Sunday. And back in the 21st century, internet is all good. And I should take a note there, too. I told uh, John this just a moment ago. I come from small town Ontario, or John comes from a small town as well, too. We'll talk about that later. But it seems like if there's a windstorm or anything, we lose our power and all those horrible things. We had a uh, lightning hit at one of our 200-year-old uh, trees the other day and brought down a branch that took out a neighbor's fence. So uh, if we lose power today, I'm sorry, but we have a storm above us right now. So fingers crossed, all good. So it'll be a five-minute show or a 90-minute show. Uh, Ladybug is here as well, too. Let's continue on. Uh, Frank Rashad from Line 6 is here. Thank you, Frank, for joining us. We love you, buddy. Uh, scroll back a little tiny bit. And as we come back, John, just give you a little bit something to think about here as well, too. We're just going to kind of warm up and let people uh, that may may not know you. I'm sure many, most do, but you can kind of take us through uh, your origins of, you know, a young musician getting into, uh, or a young child getting into music. And you can tell us about that. That's what we'll be coming back to in just a moment. Uh, let me see here. Thomas Farrow is here. Jim Dales. Let me see. Scroll down a little further. Uh, Brad Miller is here. Thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate it. Gary Tholander is here. Uh, Dale Palmer, uh, Jerome DeJong, uh, hello, Eric and all from Edmonton watching on my laptop, and Pete Thorne on my Apple TV. Yeah, Pete Thorne, we'll talk about Pete a little bit today. What's up, Pete? That's right. He does He does some live shows on uh, on Sundays as well, too. He could be, I think he yeah. may be live right now. Uh-oh, uh, yeah, competition. I know. Sorry. And he's a big competitor. He's He's got a great following. Uh, Well-deserved, of course, too, but we'll, we'll share some of your Pete Thorne connections as well, too. I know he's a dear friend. Uh, Rob is here as well, too. I think I may have everybody, so I'm going to highlight there. So let's jump over to that right now. Let's. I know you started at a young age of like four. Tell us uh, what, what you know what you got into at that age, and uh, and take it from there. Sure. So I grew up in a small town, like you mentioned, Fairbanks, Alaska, um, and I was fortunate to be the youngest of five kids. Uh, all my, I have three brothers and a sister that are all very good musicians, older than me. Um, and my parents both played music a little bit. 
Um, and so my parents started all of us on piano. So I started piano end of, uh, I think I was just about to turn five or had just turned five or maybe was about to turn five. I don't remember. My parents don't remember too many, <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, I started real young on piano. I apparently, my, I think my mom told me I learned to read music before I learned to read English. I love it. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, I played piano for a couple of years and then all of my siblings had moved from piano onto other instruments. Um, so I kind of knew that that's what I wanted to do. And my oldest brother, who's 10 years older than me, um, he was a drummer and he couldn't, he had some guitar player friends and some other drummer friends, but in our small town, you could never find a bass player. Right. So, yeah. So he bought a bass um, I think I was about six at the time. He would have been 16 or 17. Okay. And so bless his heart. He let his little tiny six year old brother fire up his amp and goof around on his bass. And I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. It was a really nice Rickenbacker bass, which I still have. Um, and, uh, he started showing me a couple things here and there, played me some records and I was like, this is cool. So, my brilliant mom thought, oh, if you want to do bass, why don't you join the school orchestra? Oh, perfect. And I was very fortunate growing up in Alaska at that time. Everything was very well funded because we had that was the oil boom. OK. OK. So we we're wanting of nothing. So we had, you know, orchestra at school in third grade. So, um, yeah, I was I popped into orchestra there and was playing bass in the orchestra, learning to read music. And I continued playing, uh, in orchestra all through high school. That's, that a, was a, that's a cool thing. I saw you do, you do this, right? So you started on string bass and graduated eventually to electric bass. That, that must've been quite well, cool. I actually, well, I started on electric okay. with my, the bass my brother gave me, but proper instruction, you know, I started taking private lessons early on, must've been third, fourth grade. I had a great private teacher, a guy named Bob Olson, okay. up in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, and uh, yeah, so I kind of did both at about the same time. Yeah. The, the, the cool thing is, I looked up, I didn't know anything about the town where you grew up, but I looked it up today in a population of about 32,000 people. And, and that's where I grew up in a small town, Ontario, too, Ontario, well, Canada. And it, it's amalgamated now. They, they uh, I don't even know how many years ago, but they kind of took all the surrounding counties, I guess we would call them, and they amalgamated it to make it look bigger. And I got, I don't, I'm not sure why they did it, maybe to absorb everybody's debt and help, all that kind of stuff. But it was about, technically in the city that we lived, it was about 32, 35,000 people, we'll say, arguably. And I'm curious, you know, I, I don't want to stereotype, you know, uh, people of Alaska. I have no idea what the music scene was like. But I'd be curious to see, like, uh, as you say, you know, no one really wanted to be a bass player. And I, and everyone wants that glory of the guitar player. They think they're going to be like the, the front is that a singer or a guitar player. It doesn't seem like right. anyone wants to be the drummer or the bass player. But what was the scene like itself? Like, uh, were there a bunch of bands uh, or was it kind of sporadic or? There, in my experience, there were not many like rock bands, like people kind of getting in their garage and forming a band and doing that It it didn't seem like from my perspective growing up when I did in the circles I was in, I, there was not much of that. So most of my, uh, sort of musical learning was all in the school. You know, I had jazz band starting in seventh grade. Um, there was a, a there were a couple of really good summer music camps that they actually brought people up from, as we call it, the lower 48. Mm -hmm. Um, so they brought some people up, to uh teach at some of these summer camps so i got some really good instruction at those um so it was mostly that you know playing in jazz band playing in school orchestra there wasn't much like playing in a rock band from my experience right yeah. well that's funny too because when i grew up the the community where we were from the the scene used to be thriving i mean literally thriving we would have probably and like in that small population I'm going to say, I could be off off uh, off the record here a little bit, but 
probably six to 10 good rock clubs or good bars, maybe a couple country clubs. And there would be lineups at every single one of those, you know, establishments for hours to get in. You know, there'd be cover charges. People had no problem. But that was also in a time, too, where, you know, smoking, it, smoking uh, it was, you know, not restricted. And smoking and drinking, unfortunately, they just go or, or whatever for the, for the bar. It's fortunate. Uh, they go hand in hand. When they started to bring these rules out and, and ban that, you know, the tenants got less, the bars would dry up. And now in that same town, you're lucky to find, if, if I said there's probably three, I'm probably stretching, where there's live rock or live entertainment. It's really, really changed. And I'm, I'm sure that's changed for you going over the years, too, playing the club scene and all that kind of th- things. It changed a lot for you. Yeah, I mean, I... I played when I was in high school. I played some of the bars actually mm-hmm. up in Alaska. And I, rem- <laughs> I remember, <laughs> God, it's sad to think coming home at 16 with my gear just smelling like an ashtray. Yeah. I, I remember just, you know, barely being able to see across the bar. It's like kind of scary to think of a six year old in that I toxic know. environment. But- Secondhand smoke to the extreme. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I remember that as well, too. I mean, bringing the stuff home and you have a nice white guitar and within about, uh, you know, three months of playing, it's it's completely almost nicotine yellow. You know, it's just, yeah. Yeah. Or you bring it home and leave it in the car overnight and you get the next morning, you oh. open up the car. And it's like, oh, God. I know. It's like you have an air freshener of a cigarette. <laughs> Not the best, not the best for sure. Well, what was like? Okay, that's, we kind of joked about this a second ago, but everybody kind of wants to go to the guitar first because they they think they're going to be the rock star or whatever. And I'm I'm proud to see more people approaching bass as the go to instrument. I mean, I love bass. I I approach bass like a guitar player. I'm not going to lie. I can't really navigate myself on on four or five strings. I do love five strings, by the way. But um, what was it about bass that this? I know you had sitting there. You had the influence of the you know the the siblings. But why did bass speak to you um, more so than maybe guitar or another instrument? I think it was just because that's what my brother had. He had this cool looking bass laying around. There weren't any guitars in the house. And, you know, he had this electric blue. I should actually go grab it in a minute here and show you that bass. Um, But, you know, it had an amplifier and it was loud and it was cool. And, you know, it just... Their guitar wasn't really didn't seem like an option. Okay. It wasn't presented to me. The right. bass was just like, here you go. Um, but funny enough, it seems like bass somehow really suits my personality. I don't have any desire to be up in the front of the stage or like flashy. I'm like really happy to be sitting in the back, sitting setting down the foundation, and you know making a great support for whoever wants to go be flashy up front and that suits me just fine i'm kind of a mellow quiet guy and um somehow you know i think it was just luck of the draw that those cards sort of fell together that my you know my personality lends itself to bass and there happened to be a bass lying around and you know that's the way things go i guess that's very well said and i watch a lot of your videos and we'll talk about them throughout the uh the afternoon here as well too on your website but i kind of look at you as a chameleon as well too how you just you you blend in, and it's one of those things. I, I think you nailed it when you said you just you just fit in the background, and these musicians, all the different ones we're going to talk about today that you've played with, it's like you know you you fit in there, and I'll, they just they have that comfort zone. They just they may not necessarily see you in the forefront all the time. You're not out there in front of the stage. You, some of the some of the bigger bands we'll be talking about throughout the day, they're up on the front. You're you know you're back with some of the guys and the orchestras and and some of the other uh, you know background singers and stuff that they have. But yet you're contributing such a mood in, in a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, kind of a landscape or an atmosphere that lets them vibe. And without you, it would be, it would be a big loss, but you're not necessarily look at me, look at me. And it's re- very, very cool and very respectful, too. Yeah, I feel like I, it's funny. I feel like bass is kind of like pie crust. OK, that's good. You know, if you have a really good pie crust, the pie is great. If yeah. you don't have any crust, there's just going to be a bunch of jelly flowing all over the table right yeah. but you don't like get the pie and go man i want more crust or you know you're not like super into the crust but if it's a terrible crust well, or if it's got holes in it yeah well that's gonna be a mess too and that's gonna be no good so i don't know if that's that, a that's very kind of that's well silly said. analogy but i've never heard it referred to as pie crust but <laughs> uh, from someone here that in the house here uh nocturnal butterfly that uh, runs the chat here uh, Sandra, she's she's an amazing cook, and when she makes a good pie, I can relate to that. So if it, you know, I I'm not a pie person, but if I if I'm gonna have one, I want that 
that crust to be good, and obviously you want the uh, the the nucleus to be uh, <laughs> it's good as well too. So that's awesome. Well, you want to just eat the crust. That's I, no fun. No, exactly. <laughs> But yeah, you do it. You do it very, very well, and that's very, very Thank cool. I, I look at you now. This is, I'm going to compare you to a guitar player in a second, and he's been on the show several times, and and someone I really admire for the same traits as Steve Stevens and Billy Idol, um, and obviously playing in other great bands now too. Uh, Deadland Ritual with another great bassist, you know, Geezer Butler. Um, mm-hmm. But Steve is that kind of guy that could easily be. Like, I mean, with the experience that you have, you could easily go out and form a group and be like a, a forefront person, but that's not you. Steve could do that same thing as well, too, but he's very, very happy to be kind of, um, you know, playing in the background, but keeping things all together. Now, he's a musical director and things like that as well, too, but it's so admirable to see people like that, that and it just lets the others shine. And it is a it is a 360. It's almost kind of like an intravenous that every musician has going amongst them and sharing that that you know you and the drummer are always locking in. And we'll talk about some of the you know the actually the kind of the famous backgrounds of uh, the drummer with you right now in the Who. Uh, but it's really cool how the, the, you all work in a, in a in a harmony or a synergy. Yeah, and you know everybody can't be the front person. I mean, unless it's the Who, right? Then you have yeah. the front people. But um, that aside you know, you need to have some puzzle pieces that fit together, you know, some yin and yang, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so for sure. Just before I go into the next question here, I wanted to just mention as well to Gary Tholander, one of our regular uh, friends and fans of the uh, show. It's his birthday. So happy birthday to Gary. Happy birthday, Gary. And I always love saying this name is one of our, one of our regular viewers as well too. bucket full of balls says congrats on the new format. And, um, I don't even know if I shared this with you, but yeah, we, we were kind of a, an EVH, uh, themed show. Like, I mean, I love Eddie Van Halen to death, but, um, we had several shows we'd run. We run an EVH show and we'd run a Kramer show, which is under the Kramer Gibson umbrella. And then of course this show, which I really enjoy the Helix Hour. Um, so we've changed some things up a little bit and we're getting some good positive feedback on that. So thank you. Okay. I really appreciate that. So studying, studying jazz, I mean, I, um, I follow a couple of people in the guitar world that I, I, I'm not a jazz guy. I don't know much about jazz. I can't play a jazz chord to save my life. But people like Oz Noy uh, as a guitar player, a phenomenal player. Another player I've got coming up on our other show, uh, Alex Skolnick. I mean, he's a shredder, and yet he's a jazz guy, amazing jazz. Did jazz help you um, find your voice or your style, or was it that plus other things? Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously, you know, every input you have sort of uh, informs what you do. You know, it's all going to come out. Um, I would say that studying jazz uh, enabled me to be able to do a lot of stuff on the fly, okay. you know, because yeah. in jazz, you're you're improvising and, you know, things are happening in the moment. Um, and... I have found that to be a real, really important skill for what I do, you know, as basically I'm a sideman session guy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and as that, you don't often get much time for rehearsal and figuring things out. You got to just like go do it. Um, and so having those skills of being able to kind of really listen and see what's going on and react to things and make things sound good on the fly without much rehearsal. I, I feel like playing jazz really helped me with that and to feel kind of confident in like, okay, we're going on stage. I have no idea what's going to happen, but we'll make it happen and it's going to be fine. Yeah. You know? I, I, I know this might be an extreme analogy here and I always like to try to put things in perspective for people like myself. I really don't know the style of the genre that well. Uh, and they can relate to it. And this goes back, it also shows my age, but, you know, watching the airplane movie, Leslie Nielsen, and, you know, all those funny, you know, comedians and stuff like that, too. And it's like, okay, uh, I look at jazz as, they, you know, the pilot is now sick, he's passed out. Um, excuse me, do you know how to fly an airplane? You know, and it's like, you got no prep time. It's like, okay, you jump into the cockpit and you got the stick. Where do we go from here? And you are either going to, you know, God forbid, uh, have a rough landing uh, at best, or who knows what, right? So yeah, it, being able to improv and you know no preparation, and I like that. I like guys that can improv on any instrument. That's why I've always liked in gu- the guitar world someone I really really love. Now it's more rock, but Joe Satriani. I find that guy can improv like crazy, uh, you know, on on the fly. Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, it definitely it definitely helps for sure. So that's very cool. It's very nice to see that, and. Uh, I was, I've been obviously surrounding myself with a lot of Who videos over the last couple of days. Some of the tour, like the Rock and Rio is watching today off of your website right. and stuff like that too. And it's just, I can almost feel 
what you know what Pete Townsend's going through and you know having that nice foundation that you guys got locked in there and it's nice to be able for the musician to close her eyes and just groove I mean just you know and that they're doing that so we'll, and we'll also talk about shortly here as well too uh, how you got that gig and I'm anxious to, to find that out I mean I know you've earned your 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 way in in music but well I'd like it's always nice to hear those stories sure but the cool thing is too obviously you know studying some of your backstory I it's it's it brings this whole circle complete some of the guests I've had on the show before and two Canadian boys obviously um, and you're good friends at least I know with one of them but I did, had no idea, and I even watched this video before, but I didn't know you at the time. So I didn't, it's like, I, and you blend in, as you say. I didn't know it was you. So I was watching <laughs> a video with uh, Ian Thornley, I love him to death. Uh, it was the sewer uh, factory kind of party event, whatever, and I think it was 2014. It's you. Uh, I don't know who the drummer was. You can tell me in a second. But obviously, Later, Sinta. Okay, there you go. Pete Thorne on guitar and Ian Thornley on guitar. What's it like? What was it? First of all, what are your thoughts on Ian Thornley? How did that gig go? And I mean, let's talk about a real uh, bunch of uh, friends in one one sitting. Yeah, so that actually that's an interesting segue because that gig, uh, I think we rehearsed maybe through a couple of things that day. Okay. At Soundcheck and right. then did that gig. Wow. If I remember correctly, there was very little rehearsal. So Ian flew down from Canada mm -hmm. and I think he got into LA that day. And of course he flies down with nothing. So the, he just goes to sir and like, Hey, you got an amp and some, you guys got a few pedals. Sure. Is there a guitar? Yeah, I'll take that. And just, you know, he was, I, I was not familiar with his music at all because those guys aren't that well known in the U S and I was just blown away. He was unbelievable. What a talent, that guy. Both at guitar and singing equally. Like, oh, I know. Whoa. And improvising, like we were talking about. Just, But so that was a fly by the seat of your pants kind of thing. So uh, Pete Thorne and I guess Ian's a Sir uh, Artist. endorser. Yep. So I assume that's how that came together. Um, and they must have asked Pete Thorne. To recommend a couple guys so uh blair Santa and myself blair and i go way back and um we've played together a lot so i think pete kind of put us together and sent us the songs so i you know we just learned them and then showed up <laughs> it was played. good it was um good. turned out great though um and it was just a real joy playing with ian man he was really something I'm really and a sweetheart too. He is. I, I I've said this to him before as well too. He's been on the show. He's probably one of our favorite recurring guests. And I embarrassed him the one time, and I'm true. I know why he was embarrassed, but it, I think it was a fair compliment. I said, I look at him like Steve Ray Vaughan, and I mean that's a that's a guy on a pedestal. But Steve Ray Vaughan was the same kind of guy where he could he could be a singer in a band and be the the best singer in the band. And when he's a guitar player, he's the best guy in the band. But the two his both instruments were equal on a on a plateau. One note on guitar and a little vocal line were you know beyond measure. And that's what I think is like with Ian. It's it's almost unfair. But it's funny as well, too. I get other people that, you know, like superstars that were like, oh, I just love Ian Thornley. Like one guy who's I'm a great session. That Ian's, Ian's not like just a huge household name. I mean, he's no. of that caliber, I think. Yes, he is. But but he's not on the radar of everybody. But it's also very refreshing when you talk to people that you would never expect them to, to mention Ian Thornley. Uh, Sean Tubbs, a great, a great artist. A uh, great guitar player, you know, played with what Carrie Underwood, I think, and uh, a bunch of other um, uh, great artists, and very, very respected in the business. I I didn't even realize how much of a fan he was, and at the same time, the, go, flip it the other way, you get a kick out of this. Ian Ian, uh, Ian saw one of my shows with with Sean, and he emails me and says, "Hey, wh what's what's Sean Tubbs using for uh, for guitar strings? What gauge is he using?" and stuff like that. I'm like, "Hey, why don't you ask him yourself?" But I said, "But." on my show. <laughs> so I brought them both on the show at the same time. And it was a lot of fun. And that same episode, as I was telling you off the air, it was, it was so, so surreal. Uh, we're talking and I'm using Google Hangouts at the time. And, I, and on Google Hangouts, when you're talking, the camera will jump to the person speaking. And uh, so I said something like, okay, cool, whatever. And Ian stops mid sentence. He goes, dude, um, every time that camera switches to you, I, I swear I'm talking to Derek Smalls from, from Spinal Tap. And I, like, I'm, I'm, I, I get that a lot and I'm laughing. 
And uh, so at NAM, the 2018, whatever it was, Winter NAM, I, or actually this year, last past year, we met him at NAM, and I sent Ian the picture. All I just said was, Ian, look. And I sent him the picture with me and Derek Smalls and my son, and he's like, yes, like this, right? So he was pretty thrilled. And I told him he's coming on the show, so that's awesome as well. Right. But very cool. But yeah, Pete Pete and uh, Ian, I mean, both sewer artists. You know, uh, you know. I think, I, I don't know if Ian has his own signature amp, but I know he's got his own signature guitar. There's some pedals. Pete, obviously, his own signature guitar and amplifier and th- okay. stuff like okay. that, too. So here's a question that's come in uh, from, uh, it's just forwarded to me from Jim Dales. Question for John says, how did Michael Anthony's contribution to Van Halen influence your playing style? I'm not sure if you followed Van Halen much. Um, I, obviously, we a lot of us do here. Any Van Halen songs you consider your favorites for bass? I, I mean, I wouldn't consider myself a huge Van Halen fan, mm-hmm. honestly. I mean, I, I love them. They're great, but I didn't like, you know, do the deep dive into Van Halen. Sure. So... Uh, I don't think that Michael Anthony would be a big influence on me, though I do. Now, I've heard some stories that some of the bass on those records was Eddie. So they say. So they say. I and don't know if that's true, but whoever know. played the bass on those records, it's awesome. Yes. I mean, there's there's some great, really simple, but in the pocket, just perfect bass parts with amazing growly SVT tone. Mm-hmm. Some pretty, you know, some of those songs have some some lines that are moving along that are, you know, pretty technically, you know, uh, difficult. So, yeah, I definitely total respect. No, very cool. Van Halen, but I wouldn't say I'm, you know, a fan or, you know, that that influenced yeah, me. Yeah, just a respect for sure. And that's the thing, too, if you think of that, but back in those days, uh, there was not hardly anything of until later, no overdubs. So that bass, whoever that was playing bass, whether it's Eddie or Mike or whoever, but Mike certainly did it live, had to hold that pocket along with Alex to uh, to control, you know, there's no overdubs, right? You don't have all this ice, extra icing that we have today. I suppose, yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess, I mean, they probably could do some punch-ins here and there, but but yeah, no, uh, no Pro Tools yeah. scoots around. That's right. It was all, all tape, rewind, and do it again, punch in, punch out. But before we get jumping into the who here later on uh, throughout the program, I mean, you've had a really a very illustrious uh, career with uh, some, some major artists. And for, you know, I, I know some of them, but some of our fans and viewers right now watching may not know the whole story. Can you share with us, you know, going from, you know, small town Alaska to getting some of these, you know, the, the first big gigs and uh, maybe share some of the names that you played with over the years and how they've maybe, you know, helped you, uh, you know, through your career and to where you are now? Sure. Yeah. So uh, I left Alaska when I graduated high school and I went to, uh, I studied jazz okay. in college at University of North Texas. Um, met a lot of great, there were a lot of great musicians there at the time. Um, and then I, you know, I always kind of had my sights on LA. Um, and so I moved out here way back in 1994. I knew two people, (laughs) um, literally. That's scary. Uh, And, uh, I just, I, I thankfully, when I was living in, uh, so where I went to college is near Dallas okay. in Texas. And I was playing in like a, you know, cover band. We did a lot of weddings and all that kind of stuff. I had an apartment for $90 a month wow. in De- Texas. <laughs> and I was making relatively pretty good money playing in this cover band. So I, I, after I graduated, got out of college or left college, um, I stayed there for an extra year and saved up some dough so that I could, you know, kind of, skate for a while in LA. So I hung out in LA, uh, and both people that I knew here were musicians, thankfully. And they had a few gigs and introduced me to a couple people. And I just said yes to everyone and everything. Um, and just always tried to give every situation my 110%, you know, and slowly, you know, the person, the drummer in this band is like, hey, that guy's pretty good. I, got, I just got called for this other gig. Mm-hmm. You know, you available? Sure. Bloop. And you start, you know, kind of doing this thing. You start to meet more people. You yeah. start to network. It just kind of, you know, if you're, you know, easy to get along with, you take care of business, you show up on time, you know, you learn the stuff ahead, you learn the material, you, you know, people notice and they, you know, they want to get you on their next gig 
Exactly. And those two people that you know moving in there, two people becomes 10, becomes two dozen, you know, eventually. And now now it's a little bit of a comfort zone. That that must have been scary, though, coming from 32,000 people, you know, a small town, and then all of a sudden now to Los Angeles. And in, in again, too, maybe you're lucky. Maybe these two people that you knew lived within five miles of one another, but I'm assuming maybe not, maybe across the country somewhat or across the state. Oh no! The two people that I knew were in LA. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it's definitely. Yeah. I mean, I was pretty young, so I don't think I, 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 I don't know. I think I had a lot of moxie or something. That's <laughs> I wasn't good. Too scared. That's good. To move to LA, which thinking back about it now, thinking about a, whatever I was early twenties, you know, with a couple of bases and a and a wish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Um, but yeah, so I, I started, you know, starting to play with some singer songwriters playing in clubs around town and stuff, um, and meeting different musicians. And, um, I managed to get, uh, I got recommended by a fellow bass player. I became friends with a guy named Mike Elizondo, okay. who's an amazing bass player. He's kind of retired from playing bass. He's maybe a year or two younger than me. Um, but now he's like, I don't know, the president of Sony Records or something crazy. He produced like uh, 50 Cent Records and worked with Dr. Dre and he and can play straight ahead jazz like you can't believe. I mean, he's nice. just amazing. Anyway, we became friends pretty early on. He had played on a record for a girl that was on like Electra Records, I think. Um, he recommended me for that tour um, and I auditioned. He recommended me the audition. And I got that gig, so that was my first kind of real touring gig. Uh, her, this girl's name was Rebecca. She went by just her first name. Mm -hmm. um, and we opened for Third Eye Blind and Matchbox 20. Um, and it was like, you know, a real tour. Um, and uh, I met some good people. Uh, one of the other guys on that tour was a guy named Jim McGorman, okay. who's a guitar player and keyboard player. Um, and after that tour, Jim got called about playing with a girl named Michelle Branch, okay. who okay. was about 17 at the time. Her record was about to come out. Nobody had heard of her. Um, and Jim called me. He was like, hey, I got called about this tour. It sounds kind of interesting. Maybe we can pull a couple of our friends and, you know, do this. And I actually, I was like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember what else I had going on. Sure. But I don't know. I, you know, I'd never heard of her, like whatever. Um, but Jim was like, no, we'll get, you know, all our buddies in the band and it'll be fun. And I was like, all right. So I ended up doing that. And that was actually ended up being a really good thing because she ended up becoming really popular. Mm -hmm. So after having done that, then it was like, oh, well, I, now I have the credit of having played on a tour with somebody with a top 10 song and yes. or number one single. I don't know. Um, you know, because there's always that catch-22 of like, hey, we need somebody somebody for this tour. How about this guy? Well, who has he played with? And yeah, exactly. Nice on the resume, for sure. Ooh, and, ooh, and I've never heard of any of these people. Well, next. Mm -hmm. you know, so that kind of helped me with that, that catch-22. Um, so then after her, I played with a guy named – I ended up getting a gig with a guy named Robbie Draco Rosa. Okay. Who's a – Puerto Rican artist who was in Menudo when he was a kid. I remember that um, band. Yeah, that's the only thing I know about that band. <laughs> yeah, but he he was also in a really cool band called Maggie's Dream in like the '90s that I was a big fan of. Okay, uh, and that's a really cool band if anybody wants to go back and check them out. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, Maggie's Dream. Um, but he also uh, Robbie Rosa was known for producing Ricky Martin's big record with live in Lubita loca and all that oh, so wow. he wrote all those songs produced that record which that record was enormous sure was so he had that tracker track record for him and a bit of money in the bank um so he had done a solo record um and was putting a band together and i ended up somehow i forget how but i i that was another audition i did auditioned for him he auditioned a lot of guys and i got that gig so i did that for a while and then um, when I had been touring with Michelle Branch, we had been doing a bunch of sort of like festival shows with Shakira. Okay. She, she had a big single at the same time as Michelle. 
and I had, you know, become acquaintances with her band. Like you'd see each other backstage. Hey, what's going on? Mm-hmm. Blah, blah, blah. Um, and so her drummer, Brendan Buckley, had been living in Miami at the time. He moved to LA. He kept my number and he was like, hey, you know, what's going on in LA? Blah, blah, blah. And so we kind of became friends. And then uh, Shakira was looking for a bass player. And Brendan thought, hey, so John had played with this girl singer, Michelle Branch, like a pop girl singer. And then also this Latin guy, Robbie Rosa, who is also well known for being a tough customer with musicians. Like sure. he can he can be tough to please. And Shakira can be the same way. Sure. So Brendan thought, you know, with those two things, I bet I bet John would be a good fit for Shakira. So he called me up and I was kind of like, ah, Shakira, I, I mean, bless her heart, I'm not huge, you know, I don't I don't have a big stack of Shakira records that I listen to on my time off. Um, but I was like, yeah, it could be could be a good thing. So I ended up doing that. It ended up being super fun. Really yeah. good band, great musicians, really fun music to play. Um, and I toured with her for two and a half years. Wow. Uh, had a ball. We went all over the world. Um, and then uh, after that, my friend Mike Elizondo that had got me on the uh, Michelle Branch. Well, no, he got oh. me on the Rebecca tour. Right, the, right. the girl Sorry. before Michelle Branch. It's getting all convoluted. Yeah, it's a long story. Um, hopefully, I'm not boring everyone. Not at all. Uh, not at all. So. I turn on the TV and I see Mike Elizondo playing bass with Cheryl Crow. Oh, okay. And I'm like, hmm. Mike's a at this point a huge producer, songwriter, you know, like maybe a label executive at that time. I'm like, and he had co-written a song and produced a song for Cheryl Crow. Okay. He's on one of the late night shows playing bass with her, and I'm like. He's not going to do that. He's not going to go on tour with Cheryl Crow no, and leave all this like producing and you know mega stuff behind. And so I call. Fortunately, we're friends, and mm-hmm. I call him up. And I was like, "Hey, uh, you know, I just finished this tour with Shakira, and if you happen to hear of any gigs that need a touring bass player, let me know." <laughs> <laughs> and he did, of course, because he didn't want to do it. Yeah. So he called me back. He's like, "Hey, uh, yeah, I can get you. You know." I don't think I'm going to end up doing this tour. I wanted to do it, but I'll get you audition. And so, yeah, I auditioned for Sheryl Crow, got that gig, and that was a real dream. Like, I'm a big Sheryl Crow fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's the coolest person in the world. I love her music. Um, she's a really great musician, and her band is top notch. So that was uh, to get that gig was a was a pretty. I was pretty happy about that and so i toured with her for maybe i don't know another couple years maybe okay um and then yeah after that i you know it's funny when that tour kind of died down i was like man where do you go from sure i actually had a conversation with my wife like what do i do you know where do you go from here the bar is raised so high at this point right um yeah and then ring hey do you want to audition for and actually Pete Thorne yeah. recommended me to audition for Roger Daltrey and Roger was putting together a solo thing to go do tours on his own because Pete wasn't, uh, Pete Townsend wasn't touring enough. The who was not touring enough for Roger's comfort. Gotcha. He wanted to go, you know, stay busy, which he likes to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I auditioned for that. A lot of guys came out for that audition and, um, I managed to snag that position. I played with him for, now it's been about 10 years that I've 10 years ago that I started playing with him. So wow. I guess I'd played with him for about eight years. And then thankfully Pino Palladino found something that he wanted to do more than the who. And Roger went to Pete and said, Hey, you know, give my guy a shot. And there you go. That's fantastic. See, I did not know that. So that's very, very cool. The fact that you worked, you know, you worked with Roger first and the fact that, you know, for that length of time, it was such a comfort zone. And uh, so that just it was seamless. That's great. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. What a great story. And it's so cool to put it all together. And, and I know it, what it's like anything in life, whether you're a musician or, you know, maybe you work in the, the professional field of, you know, maybe you're a contractor or this or that. Or, you know, it's hard to say no sometimes. 
And and if you do say no, you might think back, okay, oh, what could have been like, like you know, some of these famous bands we see all the times, like they turn down the gig and then they go on to superstardom, like, oh man. But at the same yeah. time too, maybe you can like in the acting field, sometimes an actor will take on a role and then they get typecast in that same role, like in the same style forever. They can never escape it or they're never appreciated for what they do outside of that thing. So it's cool. I'm glad to see that, you know, even though they maybe were not the first thing you wanted to jump at, you did. And it really, really was a blessing to you. It's worked out well. And I have to say there have been, you know, some things that I have said no to mm-hmm. that I was glad about. Yeah. Of, oh, of course. Exactly. You know, because I got asked to do a decent sized tour um, not too long before Roger called. Mm-hmm. And. I would have been out on the road and couldn't have, you know, you can't just bail on a tour to go play no, with somebody else. Cause, no, because that'll shut you. That'll shut down your career very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there have been times where I've gotten calls for some pretty, you know, I'm sitting around doing nothing, really, mm-hmm. you know, tour ends. And I'm like, God, I hope I work ever again. <laughs> you know, Honestly, you know, you have those thoughts, you know, I'm sure people are like, oh, you know, what? But you really, you know, these tours end, and you're like, oh, geez, I don't know what now. I know. And, and a, a call comes in, and it's kind of like, you know, eh, I don't have anything else, but I feel like something's telling me I should say no to this. And then two weeks later, you know, some other thing that's much better, and you're like, whew, glad I said no to that. I other, know. You know. It's so, I mean, yeah, it's lucky. It's almost like, you know, you're watching final destination the uh you know those those horror movies it's like okay you, you escape death here at this point but something comes back there but in, on the opposite way you said no for a reason there was something waiting and just thank god you had whatever it was in the premonition or whatever the gut feeling you know to uh to to act on that so that's fantastic here's a really good question that was funneled to me uh from bam ozzy bam ozzy is one of our regulars and friends here and uh, I was going to ask you a question about some of your favorite bassists and influences uh, throughout the years. But obviously, there's a very famous bassist within The Who itself. Uh, you know, uh, he's no longer with us, unfortunately, John Entwistle. But he says, uh, uh, was John uh, Entwistle a big influence? And how did it feel to play in, in The Who, obviously, in his footsteps? I mean, he's one of those. I put a few of these guys on platforms like the Billy Sheehan's, the John Entwistle's. I mean, uh, Geezer Butler's, you know, more, uh, you know, all these all these cool guys that are bass players that are household names and kind of shredders on the bass. Uh, how did that feel? Was he an influence on you? And what was that like? I know I know it's like you're not there to be John Entwistle. You're there to be John Button. But tell us what that was like. Um, so I have to say I was not a huge uh, Entwistle fan growing up, mm-hmm. not later. And similar to the Van Halen, like total respect. But, you know there are only so many people I think you can do the deep dive into. Um, and also, you know, Entwistle wasn't really my style, yeah, you know, I was I'm style, yeah. really my natural thing. My wheelhouse is like meat and potatoes pocket like guy, you right. know? Um, so yeah, I didn't grow up, being a huge Entwistle fan, I wasn't a huge Who fan growing up. Cool. I got into the Who a bit later, probably uh, in my late twenties. I kind of started diving into them, and also I grew up listening to a lot of jazz and stuff. I kind of got into rock later. Okay. I didn't grow up listening to a ton of rock music. Funny enough, um, so a lot of that stuff came later. Um, and so, yeah, learn. I mean, now I'm just a huge Entwistle fan. I mean, after dissecting all of his parts, yeah. it just amazes me how brilliant some of the stuff he did was. Um, but in addition to the fact that he, I mean, he's a shredder. Mm-hmm. Also, so much of the things he did were so unorthodox, like different than other bass players did. Um, he has a lot of, he has a certain technique where he kind of, smacks the strings it's almost like the slap thing but with his fingers with, with his fingers and kind of and that's a whole thing that i i do a bit of okay but, and he'd play with like three fingers and all oh, uh, i mean i you know i i just kind of touch scratch the surface of things that he did you know it's like it's a pretty tall order i mean thank god i started with roger way back and definitely had yeah a year ramp up before i got on stage with the who, but you know, I had to do all that same stuff with Roger, you know, and 
Um, but it was definitely a big challenge and still is. I mean, I still, you know, there's, there are parts that I still am trying to improve my execution of, you know, it's, it's a tall order. And like I say, it's really outside my wheelhouse. I mean, sure. Yeah, that's yeah. not my natural style to play real flashy and all, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, I totally get it because, you know, obviously growing up as a young lad, you know, you you probably only heard a couple of the hits on the radio and you wouldn't necessarily go because you're not necessarily a Who fan back in the day. And I, I only I only know some of the, the staple hits as well, too. There, and I'll tell you about one of my favorites in a second. But I mean, obviously, getting the gig now, you gotta you gotta get in that mindset. You gotta absorb. You gotta listen to the catalog and just consume it twenty four seven to you know to to grab it. Um, and one of my absolute favorites, I was posting this on Facebook the other day. I don't even t- say this very often. Like I'm a Van Halen nut, and I, my favorite song of all times in, in, in the entire catalog of the world is Unchained by Van Halen. But an arguably second favorite song, and this surprises a lot of people, is Eminence Front. Um, that, right, that is surprising. I know that that song just has. I can remember what I was doing the first time I heard it. I remember driving in the car. Um, it just, oh, it just, just totally, totally grooves. Is is there a particular song? And then now that you know you're in the band, you know, not necessarily a fan growing up. Is there a song that just, you know, maybe wasn't the first song you heard by the Who, but playing it live? Is there one that you groove on that just kind of takes you to another place? Um, boy, it's so hard to say, you know, that's almost like trying to pick your favorite child. Yeah, you know? I get it. Yeah. Like, I mean, I love so many of the songs. It's funny. I find, and people, you know, people ask me that a lot. Um, one of the songs I really enjoy, uh, playing is joined together with the band. Okay. I don't know if you know that one. I do know. Of um, it, yeah. Yeah. And w- one of the reasons for it is that it's, a simpler song. Okay. And so I can kind of relax and have fun, look out in the audience a bit, see what, cause there's a lot of the set where I'm just like, Oh, I gotta, oh, gotta play all this <laughs> stuff. And make sure that the bridge comes after five bars of this. And nah, you know, I mean, I'm not too stressed out, but I have to keep my eye on the ball, you know, sure. but that song is just kind of plays itself and it's just fun. And so I really enjoy playing that song. Um, but and I also I gotta say there, um, I really enjoy the songs that I don't. There are s- some songs in the set that I don't play on. Oh, okay. And I'm just sitting back and being a fan and just watch. That's you cool. Know, some Pete does some solo songs, and then Pete and Roger on this tour they do uh, a couple of songs by themselves, just the two of them. Nice. And, and I just love sitting on the back of the stage and watching them do their thing you know because i'm a fan of you know? course yeah so oh that's very yeah. cool that's very cool and it, it's it's very aw- awesome too that you're you know transparent when you say you know you weren't the biggest fan because uh, you know a lot of people might get a gig and of course they're just going to embellish it say oh i've been a fan forever so i mean very honest and transparent so very very cool uh let me see there's another question that came in as well too um okay i guess it's kind of the very similar question just asked about the favorite so is there a favorite song that you'd like to listen to on the radio by them Whew. Yeah, you know what's funny? That's One of my Matt favorite Crow, songs way. is My Wife, written by Entwistle. Okay. On Who's Next, which we never play live because it's an Entwistle song and he sang it. But I think that's a great song. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm not, honestly, I'm not familiar with that song. I'll have to look that one up just to, to, yeah. to know it. That's, that's from Matt Crystal. Good question, Matt. But um, uh, Won't Get Fooled Again. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm probably my favorite record is Who's Next. Okay. So take your pick from any of those amazing songs on that record that just, yeah. Yeah. Well, now we're going to dive into when we used to do the Helix Hour for the past few seasons, we used to do it for a 60 minute show and we're approaching the 60 minute mark right now. And people are thinking, we're not even talking about Helix. So now that we have our <laughs> Helix Hour plus, which is now a 90 minute segment, this actually opens up the door to jump into the, uh, the technology side of things. So obviously yeah. uh, on all your tours, I mean, for, uh, for the bulk that I've seen throughout your tours, you're a big Ampeg guy, uh, really sure. embracing that brand and really, really cool with Ampeg now being part of, Yamaha guitar group it's just it's a nice family with other products that they offer the Yamaha guitars and of course line six when was it that you discovered helix how did you discover it and uh what did it do for you as as a as a bassist and a musician so uh when initially I was playing with the who um like you're saying I use a SVT Mm -hmm. uh, but with the who I would also have I had a Sir Badger I saw that on top of one of your heads yeah. Yes, I had a Sir Badger with a uh, 12-inch greenback um, and cranked up 
like a Marshall, and I just run both of those at the same time. Okay. Um, so the I would have the Ampeg fairly clean, a little, you know, starting to get break up just a little bit, and then the the Sur would be pretty grindy. Mm -hmm. And the together, you know, you have the fairly clean low end that stays tight, and then a nice grind on the top to get kind of that growl that you know Entwistle is known for, and the gives that who that kind of grit, you mm -hmm. know. So that was my rig. So then cut to uh, about six months ago. Uh, they asked us about, you know, hey, we're going to go. We had been on hiatus for about a year. And then they decided, hey, we're going to go on tour again mm -hmm. with full orchestra. Oh, man. Um, and so I had, we had done a Roger Daltrey solo tour last summer with full orchestra. So I was kind of up to speed on how that was going to work. And they set the band up in the middle of the orchestra. The orchestra is around us. So I have the violas are maybe three feet oh boy. from my oh boy. stage position, all with, you know, every single one of them has like a condenser mic. Yeah. So <laughs> volume is going to be an issue. Yeah. So you you can't really show up with your <laughs> eight tens and Marshall amp and like crank up. Yeah. It's just not going to work in the front of the house. And additionally... I don't know whose decision it was, but they decided they were going to, that believe it or not, Zach Starkey, the drummer, is going to play electric drums. Okay. So basically, hardly any stage volume. Gotcha. Um, the band. Um, and, you know, you can't turn down. I mean, my SVT was running about as low as it'll go without starting to sound anemic. Yeah, exactly. You're basically enough to feed a microphone and or a DI and you know, that's about it. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, you know, I think for this tour, I think I'm going to try, you know, and I thought about doing like, uh, plug in the SVT into like a load box, yep. which is tricky because finding a 300 watt load box for an SVT is a issue. And, you know, and I started thinking, I was like, you know, let me, Give the the Helix a try, like you said. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sort of in the family there. Ampeg and Line Six were, uh, you know, joined together. Um, and uh, you know, I had some conversations with Pete Thorne, as I always do. Pete is my tone guru. I'm <laughs> so fortunate to be friends with him because I can pick up the phone and go, "Hey, I got this tour coming up. What do I do?" Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I talked to him a bit about the Helix. I actually talked to him about the, uh, what's the other really fancy modeling thing that everybody uses? There's the Kemper. Uh, or, Kemper. Uh, yeah. So I talked to Pete about the Kemper, um, cause a lot of people say good things about those. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was a problem for me with the Kemper is I knew I wanted to run both a guitar amp and a bass amp. Okay. Um, and I, you know, Pete told me that with the, the Helix, I would be able to do that sure. in the one box. Yep. And I didn't want to have to get, basically I'd have to get three Kempers. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> you know, so I, didn't, spare. I didn't even know that. I didn't, like I, I'm familiar with Kempers somewhat, but I didn't even know that you couldn't run a guitar and a bass amp at the same time. That's, that's kind of I cool to learn. I think so. Somebody might correct us on okay. that, but okay. that was the word I got from Pete Thorne and I trust him. Sure. I would too. Um, so anyway, um, so I, Asked Line Six to I, if they would please, very pretty please, send me a Helix to try out mm -hmm. and see. And I, you know, I, I plugged it in. It sounded really good. I ended up spending a lot of time uh, trying different IRs. Yeah. And I, I wanted to shoot myself. The rabbit just, hole, right? Yeah, you just spend. Uh, yeah, I know. I hear you on that I one. Wicked rabbit hole for like a month, just like tweak and tweak and tweak and trying all these different IRs. I ended up using the Celestian okay. IRs, and we can at some point, if you want, I can go into exactly what I was I, I am using. Um, sure. But yeah, I tweaked with all kinds of IRs and different combinations of different amps and blah 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 blah. Um, and it, like I say, initially it sounded good, and then you know I tweaked for a while, and I I got it sounding really good, um, and I was pretty nervous. Showing up to who rehearsals with just yeah, I know a little small pedal board, yeah, yeah, and like you know, you work on the tones and stuff at your house. Different, and... st different story on the stage. Yeah, I 
considered go- renting a rehearsal room and firing up a big PA and listening to it through there. But it's, I have a hard time judging a bass tone when it's not in the context of a band. Oh, of course. Huge. Because, you know, cymbals mm-hmm. mask a lot of high end. You have this bright, super distorted bass sound, and then you put a guitar and a drum set on it, and it sounds like, you know, this tubby, clean sound somehow. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's a, you know, I was kind of like, oh, I'll just hope for the best. I recorded, I actually found some isolated original Who tracks. Mm-hmm. And recorded my Helix along with those and listened back. And I was like, eh, it sounds, sounds pretty okay. good. That's good. Sent the mix over to Pete and said to Pete Thorne and was like, hey, you know, what do you think? And he's like, yeah, it sounds, you know, sounds good. I, I approve. And so <laughs> I went for it and it, it it's ended up working really nicely. The front of house guy's happy. Um, I really am enjoying having everything. Like as a bass player, this is the first time I've had like the push a button and everything changes scenario. Yeah. yeah. I'm used to having a bunch of pedals and whoops, that knob got bumped and you know, you got to hit these six buttons when you go to that song. And so having that, you know, every night you hit this switch and it's always yeah, the same. Hit, hit, or, or hit another switch. You got another decade of the who it's like you, you can go from decade to decade, decade without switching all your real amplifiers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's been working out really well. It sounds I, I'm listening to only the Helix. I have a uh, so I have a Tube DI, a really nice Tube DI made by a, a, a guy that has a company called Noble. Okay. Um, so I get this really nice Noble DI. I go into that first, so I'm hitting some tubes, um, and I send that DI to the front of the house and to monitors, but we're not really using it. We're pretty much just using the Helix only. Um, and uh and that's an interesting thing that especially bass players i think more than guitar players have to keep in mind is any kind of digital gizmo has a latency Mm -hmm. to it so for my rig i'm hitting a analog di first so that signal is you know the di is a little earlier than and that can cause phasing issues um so i had to have the monitor desk delay the di by it's like a couple four milliseconds, milliseconds yeah. or something um so that they're in phase okay. um, but anyway we're pretty much just for my in-ears i'm listening to only the helix and it sounds great i love it nice well i'm, yeah. I'm curious you talk about pete I, I like to see i like to flip over to the other pete for a second so you know pete townshend's obviously had you know analog gear forever it still, still does um what what was like, I'm sure you're probably almost a little nervous, you know, like, I mean, obviously it has to ple- be a pleasing sound for Roger, but Pete over on the other side of the stage, what were his first reactions to this new technology then? And, and you're fitting in nice with it. He seems to, he seems to be liking it. I mean, he's listening to it through his monitor yeah. on his side of the stage. He uses wedges. Um, and he does an interesting thing. He uses four wedges Okay. and he has different things coming out of different wedges. Oh, wow. So, so if he wants to hear a little more of this, he can kind of just okay move to the speaker around, yeah, which is kind of cool. Um, but yeah, he he seems happy with it. He you know, I'm if he wasn't, he would he oh, would yeah, let me you, know. You'd hear about it for sure. That's that's awesome. I, I like the fact he's using four wedges too. So yeah, a little bit need a little bit brighter over here. Just move over to this one, and I can imagine someone like him as well too. Um, you know, you talked about having to keep the stage volume down. The Who was never a band that worried about stage volume. I mean, they, they set records for it at one time. Uh, yeah. I imagine it's probably a blessing to a lot of the uh, the fellows in the band, you know, keeping this at the orchestra, obviously, forced this upon you. But now yeah. you've got that, you know, comfortable stage volume, which is great. Yes, I I kind of like it. Pete's struggling with it. Yeah. Because his problem is he starts to hear the house. Oh, yeah. Okay back to him yeah loud and it kind of makes him crazy um so he's it, we're kind of figuring we it took a minute he was struggling at first mm-hmm. when we we're quiet um but uh he's he's figuring it out yeah good well, if i saw correctly um I'm, i may have changed since uh, the last time i looked but on your instagram page you have you're using a, an lt is that correct you're still using lts or using helix floor yeah. now okay yeah now do you do you um to kind of cover their whole catalog i mean the, i mean their their catalog goes forever are you using like various presets to cover various decades or is it basically a couple uh, like a almost in stomp mode or how, how are you running it 
Um, so I have, uh, I don't know the semantics of how to describe all the things, but I, my main patch has along the front, it has four different snapshots. Okay. That's right. Correct. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, so basically I have it set up so that now I recall that I have a, a base amp and then a like Marshall thing. Mm -hmm. So what I have across the, the front is four knobs that get the Marshall amp more and more distorted gotcha. as it goes from one to four. Gotcha. So number one's pretty clean, you know, and you can imagine. So I just kind of, for most of the set, I have that patch up and I just go between amounts of grind on the Marshall. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, for different songs. Yep. Um, okay. And then I have a separate preset for, uh, for Eminence Front. Okay. Nice. Nice. Song I have again. a bunch of compression and a chorus mm -hmm. on it. Cause that, yeah, that had, and Twistle had some chorus on that one. Um, and there's another, what's the other patch that I have? Oh, for real me. Okay. Um, I have a, a bit of extra distortion on both the bass amp and the guitar amp. I get that one pretty driven and it's a different sound for that. So I think just those three main sounds. Um, pretty and simple. then on the main one that I have, I have a compressor that's basically just a little bit of a boost and a little extra compression that I can kick on for a couple certain parts that I want to pop out just a little bit. Nice. And that's it. And I have the volume pedal and the little volume knob mm -hmm. totally don't work. Okay. Yep. Inoperable. Yep. Just so there's no, yeah, yeah so everything you get is full. As a bass player, you're pretty much, you want things staying and I don't want to accidentally bump some volume and suddenly the bass like dips 10 DBD DB or some, yeah. I'll have those just dummy proofed. <laughs> and, and I mean, as a, as a great bass player as you are, I mean, you can always use a volume as tone on your bass or just, you know, play a little softer. Uh, you know, I've watched you, how you adapt a lot. Like, I see a lot of your main picking is done almost right at the bridge of the bass. Like, I, I, I find you pick really far back, play or pick, or, or a combination of both. But there are ways to compensate for that. If you don't want to be using the volume on Helix, use it on your guitar or your bass. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Very cool. So other than the, um, the IR rabbit hole that a lot of us go down, uh, and here's a story I'll share with you, and I think maybe you'll appreciate this, because I went down the IR rabbit hole as well, too, and I ended up with Celestian as well, too. Um, because I'm a Van Halen fan, I bought the Celestian EVH, uh, like the 5150 style of speakers, obviously for guitar. I, I like those, the G12s. And actually, now they're in the power cab, which is cool, and the new firmware. Hi. Um, but, um, I went down that thing and I don't, I'm not an engineer, so I don't know how to get a, a get a good sound on a miking a cabinet. So I'm looking at the, every IR you get, there's like the list like this and okay, try this try three inches off the cone, five inches off the cone, one inch off the cone. It's like, okay, I think I like that one. And by the time you've listened to 10, 12, 30, 50 of them, you're like, I don't even know what I like anymore. And one day I let my eyes or my ears, I'm sorry, my ears tell me what I like better. I had a preset that I made and I was, I had a toggle of an IR that would turn on one of those EVH IRs. And I had a stock cab, just a typical 412, uh, 20 watt uh, speaker in there. I think that's one I use all the time, obviously for guitar. And so I would step on it once, it would toggle the IR. Step on it again, it would toggle the, the cab, right. right? A or B. Um, but not both. And looking at HX Edit, do you use HX Edit much, or are you, are you right on the... Yeah. Okay, good. Good to know. So um, my eyes looking at the HX Edit, every time I'd step on it and see the little IR go, you know, uh, light up, I, I'm on that one. I'm like, oh, that sounds great. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking away from my screen. I'm sitting there jamming. And all of a sudden, I step on it, on a, on a toggle, whatever. And I don't even know where I was at that point. After you step on it so many times, you, you don't know where you are. I'm like, oh, man, this sounds great. And I'm jamming for a little bit. I look back at HX Edit, and I'm on stock cab. And I was like, yes. I was actually very happy for the sole fact that because I always like to try to tell people when they go to a, like a guitar center or Long McQuaid here in Canada and they buy a Helix to bring it home, I like to say you can confidently bring it home and not have to go out and buy all these IRs and stuff like that. Totally. And it was a very, very rewarding uh, you know, experience. And I also learned something too, how we can e be easily fooled by you know, uh, slogans and brands and this and that and just y using your ears is what matters the most. It was very, very cool. But you said you did go with Celestian. So maybe let's go a little bit more technical for a second. Tell us if you're using Celestian IRs now or if you're using stock cabs or a combination of both. I know fans will love to hear that. Yeah. Well, interestingly, I tried using... Uh, so I was using the Celestian guitar cabinet 
and I was using and I tried using the stock line six IR for the SVT. Okay. I was like, oh, that doesn't sound very good. And I was talking to my tone guru, Pete Thorne, mm -hmm. and he's like, yeah, you can't, you really don't want to mix two different sort of brands of IRs okay. together because they might have a different phase thing. Okay. And so he was like, I would recommend sticking, if you're going to use Celestian with the guitar, use Celestian with the bass one if you're going to mix the two together. Okay. And that was really good advice. Um, so I ended up, I actually wrote down these ones. And another thing that's interesting is uh, you talked about using your ears and not your eyes. Yes. I ended up with, on my SVT, I have a, a, uh, a D112 okay. mic, which I generally, in the real world, can't stand D112s on my bass cabinet. Sure. But the, for some reason, this IR sounded good to me. With it built if I had known it was a D112, I'd be like, oh, I get that rid of that. Exactly. Um, so I'm using the Celestian. It's a BL10-100X. It's a 410 cabinet okay. with an AKG D112 dark. And then on my guitar rig in there, I'm using the Sur G12M Greenback 412 high, high gain. Okay. Oh, C, high gain. That, that's the thing too I've always been because I don't know anything about engineering and I'm using my very you know ignorant experience when it comes to engineering like I would I would put a four uh, SM57 on a 412 I mean that's what you know a lot of a lot of the guys do to get that you know 80s tone and stuff like that and I wouldn't approach a ribbon mic if it was to save my life but obviously one of our friends and very well respected colleagues in the uh, line six community Jason Sedaitis a fellow Canadian here and he's uh, he, I mean he's, he does this series on YouTube dialing in to get just about anybody's tones, right? And he's been an advocate for ribbon mics. And I, I wouldn't know how to put a ribbon mic on a cabinet to save my life, but it's almost now default. I go to that and I listen to a 57 now, and I hate to say it, it almost sounds harsh. You know, or, or it's just, it's so cool that we can, we're so stuck in our ways that we don't want to uh -huh. approach other things. And another tip I gave him, tell me if you'd appreciate this. I said to people, and I need people. To, I need to rewatch my videos and practice what I preach sometimes because I certainly don't necessarily always follow it. But one day, I was doing a little bit of a video, and I just put in an amp and cap. Actually, I, I went with an amp. What did I do? An amp and then a cap, or maybe I went amp and ca cap together. But I'm just hitting some chords and playing, and then I just go to the next amp and choosing it. There's probably you know 75% of the amplifiers in Helix that I would have never tried in either in the real world or even now that I have them available at my at my fingertips. I want to go to my my comfort zones, my high gains, my PV Panamas, you know the uh, the placators for guitar, or of course now with the Rev Generator, the, those are the amps I jump right into. Of course, I always like to go to a jazz chorus, a jazz rivet for guitar, because that's a beautiful, clean amplifier. But I'm talking four amplifiers now out of what what thirty forty. And, and I think we should all do that, whether you're a bass player or a guitar player. Click the first one and play. Look away. And uh, you're, if you've got somebody in the studio with you, toggle through them for you or whatever and just play and have some fun. And you're going to discover tones that, you know, you would never probably hear because you're too scared or it's not in your wheelhouse. Right. And actually, that reminds me of another thing I wanted to mention, w talking about using your ears and not your eyes yep. so much. I find for me when I was first using the Helix, I had to really not really try not to have a mental prejudice against this digital, you know, when you're comparing it to a tube amp, you sort of like, oh, the tube amp's going to be this and this digital thing is going to be this because that's my mental prejudice. Yes, exactly. You know, if you really just try to get away from that and really listen to what you're hearing the the line six to me i mean in my in-ears on stage it sounds warm as can be yeah you know and there's sort of this prejudice that's going to be sterile and and harsh or you know but you know i think sometimes those are not founded i i agree i mean it, it came in my life at a point where i needed it something fierce I was, you know, I, I just shut down my band of 12 years. We were original act. And, you know, I was in a very unhappy place as a guitar player. Then I started doing this YouTube thing. And, you know, it was a series of interviewing people a every week. And I almost forgot at the point that I was a guitar player. I mean, I've been, I'm 51 years old this year. I've been playing since I was 15 or 16. So I've been playing for a long time. But I almost forgot about it and just put it by the wayside. 
And I didn't know anything about Helix. I didn't know anything about it other than I heard of it. You know, I think I knew more about Helix, the Canadian band, than I do about this product. And uh, a guest on another show turned me on to it um, from a metal band, Annihilator, Jeff, Jeff Waters. And we were talking about EVH stuff. And he goes, oh, yeah, by the way, I used all this Helix on our last two records. I'm like, well, tell me about it, right? I discovered it, tried it. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, this, this is cooler than Tube for, for me. And I, was, I had uh, several months, if not a uh, year's worth of guilt that I'm not touching my tube amps anymore and, and my pedals anymore. And I had a massive board. It was awesome. Had everything you could ask for. And then uh, days were going by where I wouldn't turn on the tube amp. And those days turned into months. And all of a sudden now, I've like, okay, I've crossed that line of no return. Where I've, I'm, I'm, This is it for me now. And it really has changed my life. I'm happy every time I play guitar. And I'm, you know, it maybe it makes me play a little better. I can hide some of my imperfections and some of the tones, and I don't care. At the end of the day, I'm a better guitar player than I was yesterday, and I'm having more fun. So what's wrong with that? Yeah. And as a guitar player, I mean, you know, if you're in an apartment or you don't want to bug other, you know, your kids sleeping or whatever, you can put on headphones and it sounds great. You can pull up all these patches and all kinds of stuff, and it's just cool, you know? I know. I, and I mean, like yourself, this is pretty cool. I mean, you're only using, it sounds like maybe about three main presets for covering, you know, decades and decades and decades of the Who's music. But think of these artists, whether you're a bass player or, or, or a guitar player, think of doing, doing these uh, top 40 cover bands where they can cover everybody from the Beatles to the Who to Van Halen to, you know, Slipknot yeah. today. You and, have all of it. Exactly. Boom. Yeah. It just opens up the world of uh, opportunity. And obviously you're not carrying around, you know, 10, 12 different amplifiers. You just can't do that these days, right? Absolutely. Fantastic. And I want to share this too with our viewers too, because normally what we do on our shows uh, when, when possible, we have some presets available from our guests and John is going to give us a preset later on for the basis in our audience. It'll be probably a few weeks uh, down the road before you can do that, but that'll be coming and we'll share that with you as well as uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go back as well. I'll get it from you and I'll put a download link in the video here and people can grab that. Yeah. My, my helices, helices, you got it. There you go. You got it. <laughs> they are in a, Semi truck somewhere I don't know where with with the Who's backline headed to New York. You know something sure. you need to get. Do you have a stomp yet? Do you have no? St- have you seen the stomp? I have. Okay, you got to get a stomp, and I mean you would absolutely. I mean you can carry it like in your laptop bag for you know, and yeah. uh, great everything you could do in Helix is there, you know, and it doesn't sound like you're running a very intricate uh, setup. Sure. So you would sure. love that in a hotel. Yeah, and. I recently learned apparently there's – is there a software version that you can just run in the computer by itself? Is that right? Yeah, Helix Native, yes. Yeah, I just learned about that. So And it's very good. Now, so anyway. <laughs> you want to have a nice interface for that. Um, what I used to use for Native, I used to use an Apogee Jam. Are you on Mac? Is that what you have, a MacBook? Yeah, or? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Apogee Jam is a nice little interface. I think they're like 120 bucks, 100 bucks US, and a little, little right. silver thing, whatever, 96K. Um, and as long as you have a nice interface coming into it and getting a nice clean signal to native, it sounds like a million bucks. So you could do that right. as well too. So maybe you don't even need stomp. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a, I use the uh, Apollo twin. Okay. Well, there you go. That's perfect. Uh, you're all set. Yeah. Killer. Yeah. You can, you can um, get them to hook you up with a license on that. You'd be all set. Dude, totally. All right. Now, have you, have you, um, up, uh, uh, this is the other thing people, when they're touring, obviously they don't want to necessarily jump up to the next version of uh, firmware or whatever, because everything is don't fix what's not broke kind of deal. But are you at, uh, are you at the latest 2.81, whatever it is firmware? Or are you still a little back, uh, further back, uh, with the system firmware? Or do you even know? I don't know. That's okay. <laughs> so, I got my Helix in what? May? Uh, no, April. Okay. So 19. No. So, does Probably anyone work on it for you? Are, are you responsible for it? Or do you some of your techs do, do any maintenance on it for you? Or No, I pretty much keep the reins on it. Okay. So then, yeah, our, you, you'd be techs, older. Most of our techs are pretty old school. Um, so he, my techs kind of checked it out a little bit and kind of knows his way around it. But I, I pretty much, you know, I do backups on it and do all the editing and all that stuff. Okay, that's yeah. good. Maybe what you might want to do, because you have two, once a tour is done, which is in about uh, two months, and actually mm-hmm. you're coming up our way too. We'll come up, we'll try to come up and see you in September. I think it's September 3rd you're playing up near us in Toronto, so we'll come out and, uh, and have a look and listen to you guys. Um, right. But when the tour is done, take one of your units, maybe your backup one. So you have one for backup. Is that what it is? Correct. Yeah, so upgrade the backup one to 2. It's 2.81, whatever now, and uh, see how you like that. Make a backup, and of course you can always revert back. 
but it's okay. uh, it's it's a major update. It's uh, it, it's uh, a lot of things, a lot of extra ear candy in there, and, and great things that you'll enjoy. But that oh, way, cool. you know, you're not touring with it. You don't have to worry about it. And if, of course, it goes well for you, then upgrade your main one as well, too. So, Good good advice. I'll do that for sure. Thank you. For fun, I'll send you after the show tonight, too. I'll email you. I'll send you Billy Sheehan's preset he gave us. And, Great. Uh, I love it's, that. It's kind of it, in, a, in a way, too. Obviously, like, you know, John Entwistle and Billy Sheehan approach bass in a very, very similar way. They're both lead-type players, but having mm-hmm. that massive low end and shrill, you know, at the top, you know, distortion in your face guitar tones. And sure. uh, uh, he's um, have managed to uh, really blend some really cool things. And there's actually a really cool uh, guy in the community too, John Willis. He was working with Billy to to help him along the, the process of creating these tones. But I'll send it to you just for fun. And it maybe it's you, it may not be your sound, whatever, but at least it's a bass player to a bass player. You can give it a try and see what you think of it. It'd be a lot of fun. I love it. Yeah. So what's happening after the tour? As we, I think it's like the end of October. You guys wrap up with the Who. Do you, uh, do you know what's next? As you talked about earlier, it's like sometimes okay, the tour is done and what's the next phone call? Do you have plans past that? Do you know anything? Um, I know things. Okay. It's some things you can't share, right? <laughs> of course. Well, that's good. And it's probably a good thing by that smile on your face. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Yeah, there, there are things in the pipeline. Um, I'll, I think I'll probably be off. So yeah, like you say, we finish up at the end of October and I'll probably be off for the rest of the year, okay. which is good. I can hang out with my family, yeah. be home for a bit. Um, and then uh, new year, uh, beginning of the new year, I think it's in January. We have uh, with Roger, we're doing one of these. We did one last spring um, or last winter, one of these classic rock cruises. Nice. A cruise ship with a bunch of yeah. different bands. Yep doing one of those i think it's either in january or early february um we'll be doing that and then yeah there are some other things happening in 2020 good that's awesome well you know end of october a couple more months till christmas season that's nice and chill with the family i like that i saw you had a picture at nam with a big you know the big 12 foot tall whatever it was are you doing nam again in the winter january probably yeah as long as that cruise isn't at the same time which i don't think it is Okay. Um, oh, hopefully not yet. Yeah, sometimes they are the January, like those monsters of rock cruises and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then when I'm home, you know, I, I do a bit of studio work in LA playing on records and stuff. And a lot of that stuff comes in, and, you know, you get a couple days to a couple weeks notice, you know, Hey, can, right. can you do a record next week? Yeah. So some of those might come in which I love doing. Sure, sure. So, well, if, if you're fortunate enough to attend NAMM, we'll look forward to seeing you. I, I, I know you were there the same time we were there. I was over at the Ampeg event as well, too, and obviously in the Line 6 over at the Marriott, but we obviously didn't meet up. But I'll, if you're going to be there, I'll, we've got your cell phone number as well, too. I'll text you and see if you're there, and we'll say hi. The whole family's going to be there great. with us this year, so we're looking forward to it next year, I should say. Awesome. Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. Well, as we just have a few minutes left in the program here, I'm going to go backwards from the bottom of the chat and come really? backwards here. Yeah, I told it's you. Terrible. 90 minutes flies by pretty fast, just doesn't it? started. I know. I know. I love it. Uh, so a few other names. Some of the names I've mentioned already. Matt Krill is here. Uh, there's a comment that was funneled through from Tom. Tom Digon. Digon. I hope I'm not pronouncing that wrong, but from Tom says... Uh, Nice interviewing job, by the way. Your good karma flows out of the YouTube screen. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's very nice. James Severn is here. Um, let me see here. Thomas Farrell saying good things. I heard about the Placator. That's a guitar amplifier. Hellface is here. Uh, let me see. I'm scrolling backwards. Sonia is here. Nice to have you. Chris Link is here. Uh, Joe Hervey is here. Uh, let me see here. Let me see. Other things being sent to me as well, too. Let me see. Lots of production notes as we speak. Dale Palmer, Scott Roos, uh, Guitar Hack is here, one of my good fr- Canadian friends with a really uh, f- uh, successful YouTube channel. Let me see. Greetings from Vegas. That's Tom. He's from Vegas. So thank you for tuning in from Vegas. I appreciate that. Let me see here. I'm just seeing if I miss anybody else. If there's any questions that I might have missed for you. But uh, this has been a, 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 a great afternoon. I was really looking forward to this one. Headstock Harem is here. R2R3 Locking Nut is here. Sheldon Fisher is here. Thank you so much, Sheldon, for tuning in with us. Uh, a lot of love in the, in the Helix community, and I've had so much fun doing this show. I mean, of all my shows that I run, I run, uh, you know, kind of a general theme show on Fridays, uh, which is um, all, in, all open in music industry. On Tuesdays, I run a Kramer Corner show talking more about the Gibson brands, right. Kramer and Epiphone. But the Helix, it's just been so fun to see what this product and not just Helix. I mean, there's other products inside the family, too, like the Power Cabs and, and you know, the Variax guitars, which I'm a huge fan of. I don't know. I'm sure if you know much about Variaxes, but very, mm-hmm. very cool. Um, it's just 
it's been fun. Like it's just really, really uh, contagious fun. And, and I see it a lot. You know, we talk about these products on the show and next when one of my buddies gets one, it's like, it's like, okay, I'm almost afraid because now I've, you know, kind of pushed you to get this product and, and then you see the love that they have and it just, and then they pay it forward. You know, it's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love, I love it. Uh, let me, let's see if I miss anybody else. I think I may have everybody. So listen, what we're going to do here in the coming weeks, once we get the preset from John, we're going to link it here in the description and I'll send out, send out a bit of a blitz through our social media profiles to let people know that we have it. Uh, but I, again, I want to just take the moment to uh, thank you for your time here today, joining us. And uh, maybe as, as we close, maybe share your thoughts for bass players. Helix generally tends to be more approached and received by guitar players. But I know there's Helix for bassists groups on Facebook. There's a lot of bassists using it, uh, a lot of famous bassists using it. What would you say to the bassist at home that is maybe, um, A, afraid of digital technology completely, or maybe two, um, biased to the fact how we're biased with our, our eyes, that it, it has to be this way. What would you say to a bass player considering maybe getting into uh, Helix and what it could do for them? Yeah, I mean, like you say, definitely approach it with a, an open mind and open ears. You know, try it out and really listen to it. Give it a fair shot. Um, I think it's a fantastic sounding unit. Um, and it really can open up a lot of, like you were talking about, trying out tones that you might not necessarily, you know, use without going to, you know, buy another amp and this other amp, you know, you might just stumble across some cool thing that works great. And it just, it does so many things. It's so flexible. Um, it's just amazing. And to be able to have all of that at the push of a button. Um, and then I would say just be patient and be patient with, and not too afraid of if you're used to an amp, you know, that you just turn on, it takes a minute to figure out how to get around the thing. Mm -hmm. And first glance, it seems like, Oh, what is all this stuff? But once you give it just a couple minutes of figuring it, it's actually really intuitive and really easy to figure out and get around it. Take, you know, it takes a couple of minutes as anything does. That's new, mm -hmm. um, does do a lot of stuff. It's so flexible and you can do so many things with it. But once you kind of get up and running, it's it's really pretty simple and easy to get around, and good. fairly intuitive. That's good. that's good to know, and I think that's one of the most inviting things about the uh, the system: the fact that the user interface, and that's a nod to Eric Klein uh, at Line Six. I mean, it's very very inviting. Um, I, I'm not knocking the Kemper product whatsoever, and as you were saying earlier, I learned something new, and we'll find out about that too if you can use guitar and bass at the same time. But that interface on that system, that's uh, I'm not knocking the product whatsoever, but I think it's the interface on Helix that just invites a lot of us because a lot of a lot of us guys and girls that don't want to go down that rabbit hole of tweaking and all this kind of stuff it you know that's what scares most people you just it's sure. it's so easy and if you're lost you just hit the home button and i mean i don't know how many times that home button is like save me you know like whoops let's go back to where we were a second ago and it, it's it's a blessing for sure yeah and i will say real quick it's also we didn't really get into it but it uh it's so flexible i have real quick i have an amp on stage okay. that's just for monitoring and i have a i'm putting different i have a whole nother so i have an output that's the guitar amp an mm -hmm. output that's the bass amp a third output that goes to the amp that has no speaker modeling and different stuff on that okay but i'm treating it totally different so you have that flexibility to set up all this routing and yeah i mean you really get creative with it it's really routing cool is insane it's, but yeah, routing is absolutely insane. That's what I do here as well, too. Like, I'm just using it in, in, in the home, but I know you'll appreciate this. I'm running three power cabs. I've got the power cab one, I've got two power cab 112s left and right, and I've got the new uh, 212 dead center. So, coming out of Helix Rack, I've got uh, XLR outs left and right running to the stereo 212 in the middle. And I'm, and I'm doing that on a path where I've just got some of my comfort effects like wah pedal, phaser, a flanger. Uh, and maybe, maybe, maybe an overdrive, okay? And then on a, on a secondary path that runs uh, L6 link, like digital out, that runs all my, my big uh, time-based effects, like reverbs and delays and things like that, I off to the left and right. And I, I can even assign to the expression pedal how much blend I want. So I can, I'll put the left and right cabinets on an expression pedal, and I'm just chugging away on a nice, you know, Marshall-y type tone, 
and then I'll roll the expression pedal, and all of a sudden now my wet comes in. So I've got wet, dry, wet to the oh, just it's like this. So cool. re- yeah, it's like a big hug of tone. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Very and very you cool. know, when you I knew guys that used to do that back in you know the early two thousands, you'd be carrying a rack oh, and three heads and exact. speakers, and you know yep. now you just set that up in your living room and. Yeah, the big Bob Bob Bradshaw rigs, you know, like all the Lukathers and Eddie Van Halen and, you know, all those all those cats. Yeah. There's uh, two last questions here. Griffin Guitarist is asking if I use Global EQ on my Helix. No, I never, ever, I've never even touched Global EQ since the day I got it. I think that's something to do use uh, as a uh, as a uh, an eject seat button. If you're going to, you know, eject and this is going to save your life, that's where you maybe turn that on and engage it to. Uh, if there's horrible, horrible EQing and sound in the venue, you can enable that. But I'm assuming you don't touch Global EQ either. Correct. Yeah, no, it's one of the things I, th- I recommend you almost stay away for. Uh, for. Uh, and Brad Miller saying... Um, John definitely needs to get a stomp for travel. He will be, he will love it in his rig, based All on right. his rig. Look at that well, for thank sure. You. And even though native, native is, is awesome, but sometimes you may not, you may not even want to fire up your laptop. Maybe to, other than to check email, you could be over at the bed at the hotel and just, you know, noodle away and just, well, just and have a little club gig in town. Oh, sure. No, yep. throw that gig bag and off I go. Yeah. And that's the thing. Yeah. You take some of your, your main presets. Now you may not know this. The only limitation to stomp is your six blocks. So uh, I don't know how complex your rig is. We'll see it soon when you send it to us, but chop, chop, chop. I mean, really, you could essentially, technically, you could go up there as a bass player, have one block, an amp and a cab, like an Ampeg SVT or whatever, and send it off to the front of the house uh, at a small club, and you would be fine, and everything else is just ear candy. Totally. Yeah. That's cool. There you go. We'll look at a stop. So listen, don't say goodbye. I'm not going to say goodbye to you here. I'm going to say goodbye to you off the air, but I'm going to say goodbye to everyone on the air right now. I want to thank you all for joining us for season four, the premiere here of Helix Hour. Looking forward to doing this for hopefully many more seasons. Uh, I know I I didn't get a chance to say hi to everybody in the chat, but I thank you immensely for your support and joining us. And we look forward to having you back here each Sunday, 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. And John, I'm wishing you and your family all the best carrying out the rest of 2019. We'll look forward to seeing you, uh, hopefully, if you're not on the cruise at Winter Nam uh, this coming January. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Awesome. Everyone, thanks so much. And we'll see you next time right here. And watch for an update from our channels. We'll put uh, links to John's presets as soon as we get done. We'll see, Got it. we'll see you soon. Until next time, cheers. Hey, you're still here? Eric Jr. here, reminding you to check out our full lineup of quality merch. Available right now in the Broadstash Boutique. Quality products and fast shipping. Visit Broadstash.com today. Thank you for watching the Helix Hour. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation. An extra special thank you to the staff at Line 6 for their continued support. If you've not yet subscribed, please do so right now and feel free to share our content with your friends. See you next time on the Helix Hour.